let's move on to the next topic, which is number page nine. Um, drugs. Yes. <laughs> All right. Drugs. Uh, why is this under the states of consciousness section in psychology for drugs? Yeah, uh, they can alter your states of consciousness. All right. So the drugs we're talking about uh, are what are called psychoactive drugs. Psycho meaning mind, of course. Uh, these are ones that can uh, alter your mood, uh, and they can also, and do, alter your perception. So let me hold off a second and uh, explain these two, because it's really easy to just glance over these and miss what they mean. So what the heck is a mood? Wait, no, I got a better question. Here's three words that people use interchangeably, but are not the same thing. Emotion. Feeling and mood. I feel like those are the same word. They are not. They are all three different things. And I mean that technically. They are. I realize people use them interchangeably, but they're not actually the same thing. So, does anybody want to take a stab at uh, maybe telling me the difference between one of these or two of these? I would assume probably most of you can't accurately tell me what all three of these are. Particularly this one. That's the one that loses most people. But can anybody tell me the difference between these words? Are they all exactly the same thing? No. Yeah, evidently, yeah, there, there's nuances. What you got? So maybe feeling is like what you, I don't want to say feel because it's in the word, but like it's just like how you experience are or what you're experiencing and then your mood would be like how you Good guesses. Okay, so the feeling you're on, the, the mood is where you're, you're uh, diverging a little bit. So let's, let's focus on the feeling first. So the feeling, yeah, that's your, um, uh, your sensation experience here. All right. So when I say I'm happy, happy might be the emotion, which I'll get to in a second. But that feeling, that feeling of feeling good and energetic and alert, um, that is actually the, you know, the neurochemicals that are acting, dopamine and whatnot. So this is what I get from the neurochemicals, all right? This is uh, neurochemically induced neurotransmitters, all right? So the feeling is <clears throat> my actual experience. Like, uh, do I feel excited, alerted, joyful, right? A joyful is actually kind of an emotion, but do I, how do I actually feel inside of me in that, again, is it a positive? Like, am I alert now? Do I enjoy it? Uh, or would it be uh, something that would be more negative? Um, anger is a feeling. It's actually an emotion, but the feeling you have, that intense, like, oh, I want to do something about it, and then my body uh, uh, picks up its... Um, um, ramps up in sympathetic nervous system, my heart rate goes up because I want to like, hit you or whatever or say something mean and my blood's boiling, that's the actual feeling. So the actual sensation of, uh, of you wanting to share your joy with everybody or really want to hit that person or uh, want to cry, right? Those are the actual feelings. That's your experience itself, all right? That's how it actually impacts you. And those are activated by more or less neurotransmitters, all right? So when that's activated and your brain releases dopamine or whatever it's releasing, uh, that is the feeling you're getting. It's coming from the neurotransmitter, all right? So that's a feeling. So what's gonna separate that from a mood? Or an emotion? Okay, that's probably wrong. But like, it is a mood, kind of like the outer surface, like your behavior. Like you feel pretty mad, but you're not gonna hit someone. Okay. So this is the internal, that's a, that's a good explanation. I would say, not correct though, so I'll, I'll, here's where I'll go with it. I like this though, because you're talking about how this could affect my behavior, that's the perception portion, so we'll get to. Uh, but mood, mood is, the best way I could describe it is a prolonged set of feelings. 
So if I'm experiencing this sadness, this really dull feeling of being feeling really low, low energy, uh, pessimistic about what could happen, really sorry for what I did or the person or whoever, and that continues for a long time, many, many minutes or hours or days, that's a mood. So it's basically like a feeling uh, played out over a long period of time. So extended uh, feeling over time, right? <clears throat> And that's what you mean when someone says, oh, they're in a bad mood. Does that mean they're angry for a minute and then they're not? Mm -hmm. No, it means they're angry for a while. It's like avoid them because they are currently in a bad mood. So they're stuck in this feeling of whatever negative it is. Or, hey, they're in a good mood. They're like all cheery and they're doing great things and they're having a great time. Like that's, that's what we mean by mood. So it's affecting them over a period of time. Like I said, it could be days or months. Uh, it could be, um, you know, just several minutes. But... You're talking a, an extended feeling over time. All right, that's the difference. So this is the immediate sensation, the experience you get from the neurotransmitters, and this is basically if those feelings continue for a long time. All right, and before I get to the perception thing, you're, you're on to it because if this continues, that's going to affect how I see the world, interact with it, and that might change my behavior, right? That's why you ask for a favor when someone's in a good mood, and you do not ask for a favor when someone's in a bad mood. All right, because their perception's altered, all right? Uh, or their mood's altered, at least, and that could affect their perception. All right, so the emotion thing. No one's gonna get this one, so I'll just tell you. Uh, emotion is actually your brain's uh, automatic response to a stimulation, okay? So emotions you don't think about. You can't control them, all right? Most of you know this by now. Uh, emotions you pretty much can't control. You might be able to ignore them or hold back on acting on them, but that feeling you get, you can't change. So this is, an emotion is your body's uh, response, automatic response, response to uh, a stimuli, or stimulant. No, oh, we'll say stimulant, stimulant's stimulant actually a drug. To a stimuli. There she is. Okay, so the emotion is, uh, it's old, it's from the limbic system, so it's, it predates our um, um, cortical regions, right? So emotions go way back further than humans. Uh, and the reason why these exist is they have helped species survive um, before. Obviously the ones that had these emotions built in lived and the ones that didn't, did not. So emotions are instantaneous and you cannot control them, all right? So example, I'm walking along, I'm hiking, and uh, I'm having a great time talking with whoever I'm with, whatever, or I'm by myself, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I look up, and there's a bear right there on the trail, 10 feet away from me. What is my body instantly going to do before I can even think, look, there's a bear, it might eat me, I should probably try to avoid this. What's my body do? You run? Well, you don't, you don't that's the action. Cool. So you, you, you might be compelled to run, but like, what happens inside of you? What do you, what do you, what do you feel? Fear, yes. You might get that shot of adrenaline because you have to fight or flight at this point, right? But that happens automatically. So this is like a really um, primitive way that your body analyzes the situation. So in this case, the stimulation is, I see a bear. Your body goes, oh, we're gonna die, right? And that's why you get the fear. You tense up and you get that shot of adrenaline to where you either run uh, or you um, uh, have to fight. Um, and also too, I, sh I actually forgot about this, Anytime you see something threatening that you're not expecting, you will actually freeze initially. I mean, obviously you're not gonna be like, it can't see me, I'm just gonna stay like this. <laughs> but you initially stop. All right, that, that's actually an evolutionary reaction. I should talk about this in evolutionary psychology, uh, where your body automatically stops so you don't trigger uh, the, uh, uh, the prey reaction in a predator. Because if you run from any predator, they're just gonna chase you. Because that's what they're, uh, reaction is to you running away is, oh, sweet, that thing, I gotta go chase it, right? That's why cats, unless they're like lazy or whatever, uh, if you throw a little, if you like tie something on a string and throw it in front of them and you, and you have it run in front of them, they always wanna chase it, all right? That's the, that's the uh, chase instinct. So you've got it pre-programmed in you from a long time ago to when you see a threatening predator, you freeze, so you can assess it uh, because if you just took off and ran, it would just chase you no matter what. Uh, but anyways, I can't control the fact that I'm 
instantly feeling fear, and it's instantaneous. So your emotion is uh, your body's automatic response to stimulation, all right? So you see it, your brain goes, threat, oh God, oh God, and then it gives you the feeling. It initiates the neurotransmitters or the adrenaline, whatever it might be, whatever scenario you're in, um, and that's uh, how those two are connected. So they're very quick, but it's important to know this is the automatic response you have that you have no control over, and this is the experience you get when that emotion has activated. Does that kind of make sense? Mm-hmm. All right, cool. So can I control if I feel happy or not? Mm-hmm. No, for the most part, I can't. There's things you can do to try to promote it. But I mean, I can't make myself feel happy when I look at this pen. I, I, just feel like, I can't be like, mm-hmm. like it just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, I'm trying so hard. Um, because it's automatic, it's pre-programmed. So there are certain things that your brain has pre-programmed into it that when it sees it, it automatically responds to those. Uh, in the case of happiness, those are generally things that have promoted us living. So like, oh, a loved one that I know, someone familiar, and I get that happiness or that feeling of love, it's, it's automatic, all right? Uh, or if you see something threatening, you can pretty much automatically feel fear. Um, if you see something that is, uh, if something frustrates you, it's in your way of your goal, that's what promotes the anger to come out. Um, so these are all really, really old, instant assessments that your body reacts to. Because again, those are, historically speaking, you know, pre-humans or even early humans, these are things that if you uh, had to like think about each time, uh, that would get you killed. Because it's like, oh, there's a bear. Huh, what should I do about this? Let me think here. <laughs> like, you're just gonna get killed. Uh, so you have the automatic response of whoop, and then your body's ready to go, whether it's fight or run or whatever it might be, okay? So that's how emotions work. So emotion, see something or hear something, your body's automatic response to it, then it initiates the neurotransmitters or hormones to get the feeling, that ex- experience you get. And if these things are continuing over time, that would be your mood. You guys got that? Sweet. I'm glad I told it to you early because I'll definitely have to explain this to you again when we get to emotion and, and unit seven. Now that you know that, um, how might a drug affect my mood? Because psychoactive drugs are mood altering. So now that you know this, obviously we can cut this part out because uh, the emotion's not linked to the drug at this point. But uh, these two are. So when I take a drug, whatever it might be, how does it alter my mood? It can put you in an extended mood of like euphoria, like a lot of happiness. There we go. Okay, so all these drugs give me a feeling, right? They all either mimic neurotransmitters, which give me the feeling, uh, or they, uh, you know, release extra neurotransmitters, whatever they might do, or block certain ones, whatever they're doing. Uh, they give me a feeling, right? And that's having to do with my neurotransmitters or mimicking them. Does that part make sense? Mm-hmm. Like that's the feeling you get, the, uh, the rush you get, or the relaxation or euphoria you get, that's the feeling, all right? All these drugs, even the quick ones, they, it, it lasts for a while. Right, so that's the part that's mood, altering your mood. So like uh, something like cocaine is quicker, hour or two, but still that's a long time to feel one way. So that would be definitely considered a mood. Uh, you know, it might do six to eight hours, it might do a whole day, whatever it might be. Uh, that's why we call it a, a, uh, a um, mood altering substance because I get the feeling from the neurotransmitters or ones that mimic them, and then that's gonna maintain itself for a, a long period of time, whether it's one hour, two hours, six hours, eight hours, whatever it might be. All right, so you with me on that? I haven't lost you? Okay, good, most of you are on the map still. Okay, alters my mood. How might that cause my perception to change then? So if you're like in an altered state of like euphoria, let's say your dog dies, so you're just not gonna react to it as like, if, okay, so your dog dies, right? You're just okay. Oh, wow. But because you're so happy? And yes. Like, um, compared to not being on the drug and your dog, they're like, oh, no. You know? Absolutely. Okay, cool. So <coughs> what these do, and they all, they all do it in different ways, but your perception is basically how you're interpreting the information. So your dog dying is bad for most people, unless for some reason. No, it's going to be sad no matter what. As long as you cared about the dog, if it died, you're sad. I was going to say, like, oh, maybe it's suffering and you're putting it down, but that's always sad too. So... Um, Assuming you care about your dog, if your dog dies, it's going to make you sad. 
right? Some of us will be sad for longer than others, but there's no way you can have this dog you love and then it dies and you're just like, oh, whatever. Like, you just can't do it, all right? So, um, a drug may be able to alter your perception, all right? So, the situation is a uh, dog dies. Again, we're assuming you care about the dog. Dog dies, right? That's the, uh, the information. That's the stimulus. You, you see it or hear it or whatever it might be, okay? So, this is the information. It's coming into your brain. All right? Your perception is how you interpret that information. All right? So most of us, if you're not under the influence of a psychoactive drug, what's going to happen is you interpret that information as a negative, um, obviously, and you're going to feel sad, right? And your perception is this is a negative development, and I feel uh, sad, right? When my, when my last dog, I actually felt angry because the vet totally screwed up and killed him. So I felt sad too, but my first one was just this anger. Um, but anyways, uh, you're going to feel uh, negative. Anger is usually response to something negative anyway. So that's how you're perceiving it. So that's the information. Dog died. My response uh, is going to be, I'm interpreting that as a negative thing that makes me sad or angry. You with me in that? Okay. So like you mentioned, if I'm on some drug that makes me feel euphoric, um, like, uh, like say, uh, some of the opiates, the, uh, the painkillers people get addicted to, uh, heroin, for example. If I'm on uh, heroin, which I obviously don't suggest you do, but people do, and that's what we're talking about, that's going to affect uh, my perception. So is the information still going to be the same? Yes. No, the information is the same, right? Did my dog die? Yes. Yes, yes. and I saw it or heard it or whatever it might be. Info is the exact same. All right? Uh, this is just like sensation. I'm seeing the exact same thing regardless of being on a drug or not, all right? But the way I process that information is going to be different, okay? So if I'm super, you know, uh, uh, into my, uh, uh, like, what, what do we say they're doing? Heroin, whatever, opiate. If they're really high on that substance, whatever it might be, are they going to, and they're very euphoric, are they going to be as sad about that information mm -hmm. at that time? No, they won't be as sad, right? Whatever it might be, even if it is still negative, it's going to be uh, less negative. Less negative, right? Because I'm, uh, I'm in a euphoric mood. I, I feel this way, so even bad information doesn't hit as hard, all right? Now, is it gonna be the same when that, when that heroin or whatever wears off and I'm back to normal? No, then I'm gonna perceive it differently. Then I'm gonna probably hop right back up into here, okay? So uh, that's how your perception is altered. It's how you interpret the information. So that's the most simple example we can give is that when it would normally make you very sad because it's got you stuck with this particular feeling for a long time, thus making it a mood, uh, you respond differently and perceive that information differently. All right, so does that make a little bit of sense? All right, and this is partly why people get addicted to certain drugs, which we'll get into, like alcohol, for example. Because if you're experiencing a very negative emotion, you're stressed or upset or sad or whatever, alcohol can be an excellent numbing device in that it changes your perception uh, to the point that you know that it's bad, but you just don't care that it's bad. So you don't have that negative feeling associated with it, which is why so many people get um, addicted to alcohol. Specifically, they have difficult lives, which is why during the Soviet Union uh, in Russia, the amount of vodka they consumed was just an absurd amount. And it wasn't just because they liked vodka, it's because it would numb them to the difficulties of their life, which was terrible in, uh, in the communist Soviet Union. All right, <clears throat> so yeah. that's how I perceive the information as far as being good or bad, but there's another type of perception I could be talking about. So if I'm talking about a substance that causes hallucinations, do we know what hallucinations are? Yeah. What's hallucination? When you see something that's not there. See something that's not there. Yeah, see or hear or feel. It, I'm sensing, it could be touch, taste, feel, sight, or, or hearing, any, any of the five, that isn't actually there. That's a hallucination. So you hear a voice, but there was no actual voice, right? And you'd only know that because other people would be like, yeah, there was no voice, dude. And you're like, whoa, did you guys not hear? Or, yeah. Oh, or you're like, oh my gosh, look at that, you know, giant spider, but there's not a spider there. You're all like, there's no spider there. Uh, and I'm seeing it, that will be an example of a hallucination. So let's say I do take a um, drug that causes hallucinations like um, uh, LSD or whatever mushroom, and I take it, 
am I getting different sensory information than other people? No. Ooh, see, I'm confusing some of you here. Remember, hold on, pause. The way it works is the sensation, or I should say the sensory information, it's gonna be the same, all right? So let's say I hallucinate and see a spider, okay? And you guys do not. Is there different light hitting my eye that's showing me a spider? No, we're all getting the same sensory information, all right? So the input is the same for somebody on drugs or off drugs. So where's the difference then? If the sensory information is the same. It's how your brain interprets it. Yeah, exactly. So my brain is, because of its own perception, creating the illusion of a spider being there for, for whatever reason. All right, so in the case of a hallucinogen, I gotta put that up there, and we'll, and we'll get there, I'll, I'll talk more about it, but in the case of a hallucinogen, even though we're seeing the same sensory information, the same light or sounds or whatever, I'm somehow interpreting it differently than a person who's not um, on this substance. So I could see a spider that's not there, hear a voice that is not there. I could even, uh, uh, this isn't a hallucination, it's called a delusion, when you, uh, misread people's intentions. That's an example of a delusion. For example, if, uh, if somebody bumps into me, or no, how about this? If I'm walking to a different class and I notice somebody's following me, do I automatically assume that they're following me because they're on a mission to kill me? No, no you don't, right? Normally you'd be like, oh yeah, we both have a class over here, or, or whatever it might be. Or they'd ask me a question, I don't know, whatever, whatever it might be. Or we just happened to both walk in that direction. A delusion is, you take that information, same information, someone's following me, same input, but you perceive it differently. One is, oh, they're probably the same class as me, or they happen to be going this way. Another is, they're on a mission to kill me, they were sent by the government, and the government's been after me for a while, they've been tapping into my phone, they know what I, they think I'm doing something wrong, and they're trying to kill me, right? That's a delusion, all right? They perceived it incorrectly in this case, most likely, right? So, uh, that, that's kind of the difference between the two. So, that's how these can alter your perception. I can get the same information, somebody following me, the light over there off the wall, but I actually interpret it differently. I see a spider, my brain creates the image of a spider that's not there, that you all tell me is not there. Or, you know, the guy that just happened to be following me to, to class, who maybe has a class next to me, which is a, which is a good explanation for it. Uh, I interpret it as, oh, he's out to kill me, he's sent by the government, they're trying to assassinate me or, or, or whatever, all right? That's how perceptions can be altered, okay? Uh, and it makes sense too, by the way, because when I'm dreaming, do you, do you hear things in dreams? Like, I'm talking in the dream, by the way. I'm not talking like when I'm sleeping, do I hear the sounds outside. In my dream only, do I, in my dreams, talk to people and hear things? Yes. 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 Do I move around? Yes. yes. Do I feel things that touch me? Yes. 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 Do I see things? Yes. yes, you do. But am I actually getting that information from the outside at all? No. No, my brain's just making it up, all right? So you can perceive things even without the sensory input, all right? That's why you can close your eyes and imagine something, all right? That's you creating the perception. So that's where it's difficult. It's like, all right, if I'm on uh, whatever drug it might be, it could affect how I interpret the information, like how much it affects me, what, what I think is negative, what I care or not. I could totally see or hear something that's not even there, right, in the case of hallucination, or I could misinterpret what somebody's doing, which is, uh, which is a delusion, thinking they're out to get me or kill me or, or spy on me or whatever, even though they're just walking down the street, all right? So you with me on how these drugs can alter your moods and perceptions? Sweet, and you can kind of understand how they're linked, too. All right, <clears throat> I didn't want to glance over that because I, I want you guys to understand what's going on there. Okay, so, anybody lost? Any questions I can answer so far? All right. So why would people take drugs before we get into what they are? <clears throat> why, why, why? Okay, so they're feeling a lot of negative emotion and they do not want to feel all that negative emotion because that, that feels terrible, right? Whether you're sad or angry or stressed, whatever it might be, worried, it's pretty the same thing as stress, but uh, this can help alleviate that, get rid of it. Does it fix the cause? No, I'm always going to have that source, but as long as I'm taking the substance, whatever it is, I don't care about it or I feel good and it, and it doesn't bother me. That's an excellent reason. What might be another reason? Like social peer pressure. Like if your friends are going to do it, then you're going to want to do it. That's true. That's more a social psychology uh, thing. We'll, we'll definitely get there. 
but uh, I'm just talking like if I could take other people out somehow in the, the peer pressure, like why would somebody want to take a drug just for themselves? <coughs> Yeah, that has to do with uh, what she was saying. So negative emotion or physical pain too. Yeah, they're trying to get rid of some uh, uncomfortable feeling, whether it's uh, psychological or if it's its actual like you know a physical sensory uh, neuron uh, type deal. Um, like people in their family uh, wearing like their relatives um, like do drugs or like that kind of thing, and they like the way it makes them feel. Then like genetically. It so okay, like there we go. I might be more predisposed to really enjoy a certain drug. Okay, cool. Yeah depending on my, my own uh, brain anatomy and the uh, amount of receptors I have for certain neurotransmitters, yeah, I could be more likely to be addicted because maybe my genes predispose me to have a whole bunch of dopamine receptors, so I super enjoy cocaine or something like that more than somebody else would or alcohol or whatever it might be. Absolutely, so I'm either chasing a good feeling or escaping a bad feeling. Can we agree that's pretty much what they're doing? All right, cool. So they want some new, novel, fun, exciting, positive experience, or they're trying to escape some sort of sensory pain or um, psychological pain. Uh, and that's what people generally do this for. Okay, so <clears throat> that's why. So we got the why, of course. Why? Uh, chasing uh, positive feelings, right? Like maybe they don't have a bad life, but it just feels really good to be on this drug, whatever it might be. Uh, or they're looking to escape or numb uh, negative feelings. <clears throat> and then I've got a third one. Uh, they're, but it's kind of related to this. Uh, they're addicted, which we'll get into here. Well, actually right now. So drugs, they can become addictive, which means you at least feel like you need them. Um, how could that happen? How could I go from not needing this pill or a drug or whatever it might be to all of a sudden not being able to function normally without it? You had your hand up, then you took it down. Okay. Um, so I guess your body kind of gets used to the drug, so you, um, your body feels like it needs it. So when you're not on it, you feel terrible, and that causes you to want more of it? Uh, you are generally, in a vague way, you are dead on. But I think we know a little bit more about how neurons work. Could you tell me technically? If you can't, that's fine. That's a wonderful answer, because you're right. You get used to it, and your body needs to, uh, uh, to, to have that sensation or that drug uh, to feel normal or continue not feeling bad. That's true, but do, you, do we know why on a, on a neurological level? Like the, the transmitters or whatever, um, so you're receiving a lot of it, and when your body doesn't have it, it's like, Okay, well, because you're receiving so much, it doesn't produce as much as it used to for like serotonin. There we go. Serotonin. That's the biggest yeah. reason, yeah. So whether it's uh, serotonin or it's dopamine or whatever it might be, um, even for sleep aids, like we talked about yesterday for melatonin, um, <clears throat> if your body thinks you have an excess of the stuff, and obviously if you're using drugs, you're getting a ton of whatever it might be, uh, your body's like, oh, we're good. We don't need to make you more of this. So it stops making endorphins or it stops making dopamine or it stops making melatonin, at least for a while. So what happens when that drug goes away? <clears throat> okay, yeah, but like, what does that mean? You have like a lack of those chemicals. Yes, you completely lack them altogether. Mm -hmm. So I go from being super positive, like if I'm addicted to cocaine, feeling great, uh, and then since my body's had so much cocaine over, over a period of time, I don't have any dopamine or nor norepinephrine like in stock to use. So I go to feeling super uh, low, low energy, irritable, um, because I just don't even have my own neurotransmitters to make myself feel uh, normal anymore. It would take a long time for my body to recover, build them back up, and get them back into use. Like, you're thinking certainly a couple weeks, at least, for most, uh, to get back to normal. So it's a terrible two weeks. And uh, if I'm feeling awful, I realize it's not the drug doing it, but I'm feeling absolutely awful, what's going on here? What's, what's being affected? I'm feeling absolutely awful right, for, a, for five days, for 10 days, for two weeks, whatever it is. What am I uh, uh, in at that point, if I'm feeling awful? Bad. I'm definitely in a bad mood at the very least, all right? If I'm feeling terrible, I'm in a bad mood for like two weeks, even if I want to stop doing the drug, what am I super, super, super likely to do at some point? Go yeah, go find the drug again to, to just not feel crappy, right? That's what the withdrawals are. So it can be incredibly intense. And some drugs, like I know, for example, if you're, if you're depending on the level of dependency you have with alcohol, you actually can't cold turkey it. What I mean by cold turkey is just stop it clean. 
it'll actually end up killing you uh, the way your body responds to it. So depending on how deep you are into alcoholism, they may have to wean you off of it rather than just stop it. But most drugs you can cold turkey. It just really, really sucks for a while. All right, and we'll get into later, um, no, we'll actually get into today too, about um, why most people just stopping the drug doesn't help them. It, it's actually uh, partly an environmental thing. Okay, so we understand how you uh, uh, get addicted now. So addiction, that's actually a physiological or neurological dependency. So I've gotten to the point Depending on the drug, it can be from one exposure to it or to multiple. Um, my body is no longer producing my normal amounts of neurotransmitters that I need to uh, feel normal, to feel stable or happy or whatever it might be. All right, and I need that drug to get out of that negative mood or to feel happy again or whatever it might be. All right, that's the addiction. My actual neurons don't function normally unless, uh, uh, or at least feel normally, unless I have that drug into my, uh, interact with my, my neuron receptors in, in the dendrites. All right, that's the addiction. So what's the withdrawal then? Because this is what people fear when I stop taking the drug. Why do I feel so crappy when I stop taking the drug? Because I have to endure this to get my body to, to, uh, to adapt and get back to normal. Why is it dependent, though, neurologically? Why is your, you're right, it is a dependency. Why is my body neurologically dependent? Because the drug was either mimicking or at least making you release more of whatever neurotransmitters you had, and the brain didn't like that. Like, dopamine was the excess, so it stopped producing them. Exactly, right, that's what I said earlier. So your brain has stopped producing whatever neurotransmitter you need uh, to feel happy or not sad or whatever it might be. Uh, or if like it's endorphins, you're actually gonna feel pain all the time. It's not just like, oh, I feel bad, I feel like I have low energy. No, if you're addicted to painkillers, like you just hurt because you don't have any endorphins to stop the mild amounts of pain you're experiencing. You just, you just hurt, you like feel bad, you have low energy, all of that. You're, you'll, your body will panic, uh, it'll, it'll um, become overactive because it thinks you're in, in a life-threatening situation. So you'll have a really high heart rate, you'll, you'll sweat a lot, it's just a terrible, terrible experience. So the withdrawal, is the um, uh, body's neurological readjustment period. And it is almost always, at the very least, uncomfortable to unbearable, depending on, well, depending on several factors. It depends on how addicted you were, which substance it is, uh, how uh, many receptors your body has. So, you know, uh, somebody who has less isn't gonna be as sensitive to it as somebody who is. Um, so there's lots of genetic factors involved. There's the actual substance itself. There's your body size too, that could be a factor. Um, most drugs, if you're um, heavier, bigger, taller, however you wanna phrase it, you weigh more, you have more body mass, you generally need more of that drug to experience the sensation. So for example, a, uh, an average woman and an average male go to a bar and they drink the same amount, the woman on average will get drunk faster because she has less body mass than the male who's usually bigger, right? But if the male was shorter or, or, or smaller and the, and the girl was bigger, it would usually be the reverse case, uh, generally speaking. But again, you can have certain genetic um, predispositions uh, to be um, inebriated faster than others. But generally speaking, body weight is a big part to do it. Okay, so for the actual AP tests, you guys need to understand that what makes a drug psychoactive, like what that means, right, alters your mood, and alters how you perceive the information. So I can care about something more or less, or I can see or hear things that aren't there, or I can misinterpret information, like people's desires, delusions. Um, and also, they, they want you to understand what addiction is technically, not just like, addiction is I need it. It's like, eh, why do you need it? <clears throat> and then why do withdrawal periods well, first of all, what are they and why do they suck so much? All right, so if you have an idea of that, uh, you'll be pretty well off for answering any questions about that. So we're good on, on psychoactive drugs, addiction and withdrawal. We understand what they are and how they work? Generically or generally? Okay, cool. So we'll do, what are we at here so far? Class is a little earlier today, huh? Oh, snap, it ends like 20 minutes, doesn't it? No, am I thinking about that wrong? 
Yeah. No, I'm not. It ends at like 11.20, huh? Yes, sir. I talked a lot. Okay. Take a break. Drugs. <laughs> We're going to get into now the um, different <laughs> categories of drugs. So this kind of confuses some students. These are the three categories. All right, so these three... Underneath them, the drugs that, and the other categories, the subcategories underneath them, they all have common um, characteristics, all right? So, again, they're all gonna be psychoactive to some degree, which again means they change your mood and perception. Um, I think all of the ones we talk about are at least to some degree addictive, and they all, uh, they don't all have withdrawal symptoms that I'm aware of, but they pretty much all at least have the capacity to be addicted in some way, whether it's neurologically, like I can't produce the stuff anymore, so I need the drug, or psychologically, or you feel like you need it in order to be, um, feel calm or, or, or whatever. Here's a quick example of what I mean. As far as I know, technically, uh, the active agent in um, cannabis or weed, marijuana, which is THC, I've heard that it's not neurologically addictive in that uh, you can't function without it because it blocks certain neurotransmitters or whatever. But people do have psycho, um, uh, psychological dependency or addiction to it in that they feel like they need it to function normally even though their brains might not um, be operating differently neurologically. All right, so they'd be like, oh, I, if I don't have this, <clears throat> I get super anxious because I don't have it. That would be a psychological dependence, not a neurological dependence. All right, so feeling like you need it to operate normally as opposed to, oh, my brain neurochemicals actually can't function without it. All right, so they're all psychoactive. So here's the three categories. You have, I don't think this is in order, but depressants. And no, they don't make you feel depressed. And depressed doesn't mean sad, by the way. It usually means hopeless and lethargic. Um, and pessimistic. So uh, depressants, I have my third category, I should put a square on it. My second category, rather, is uh, stimulants. And my fourth, third category, I just can't count. My third category is hallucinogens. <coughs> All right, and um, there's one or two hybrids that are kind of both, have qualities of both. But there's a whole bunch of drugs that could go under these categories. And the reason why we lump them together is they have similar impacts. Now it's gonna be different, obviously, uh, because uh, for example, depressants, there, no, I'm not gonna start with that because that one might be confusing. Let's start with stimulants. Um, caffeine is a stimulant, for example, and so is nicotine. While they both do essentially the same thing, characteristically, it's going to feel different for the user. Like one is actually more addictive than the other. Um, the actual sensation, the feeling, the experience you get from them is gonna be slightly different. They do kind of the same, fun they perform kind of the same function, which is why they're under this category. All right, so I'm gonna erase this for a second. Things that you would put under the category of depressant, when they say depress, again, that doesn't mean make you feel sad, they depress or slow down your uh, neural system. Uh, so all of the interactions between your neurons, how fast you think, how many firing of neurons there are, it's a lower amount, all right? So these slow down or depress neural functioning. So would you say in general if I'm using a depressant, I feel excited or relaxed? Relaxed. Relaxed, relaxed. if you said excited. Mm -hmm. Why would I feel relaxed, generally speaking, on a depressant? It's slowing down the activity. Exactly. So if I feel super anxious, I'm stressed, I'm, uh, uh, I'm stimulated, I'm aroused. Not in like a good way either. Like I think that, uh, there's a threat, so my heart rate's up, my breathing's up, my body's tense and ready to go, all right? That is the opposite of what these do. These reverse it, so I don't know if it helps the parasympathetic nervous system, I don't know. It slows you down. So um, uh, many medications that treat anxiety for those people that are always tense and worried and stressed out, um, this can help them because they feel relaxed. It literally 
tells their uh, neurons to, uh, to, to ease up, essentially. They're less active, they're less intense, your heart rate will, will decrease, your breathing will decrease, your blood pressure will decrease, you'll breathe slower, and you'll just basically feel relaxed, essentially. So, they all kind of do this in some way or another, all right? In different ways, to different degrees. But one common thing, and which is why we put them under this category, is they basically slow down your neural activity and functioning, all right? So this, these will generally make you feel relaxed, all right? If you OD on these, it's usually because you got so relaxed that uh, your body stopped working. Like your heart didn't pump enough to keep you alive. Or uh, you weren't getting enough blood, so you weren't getting enough blood to your brain, which caused you to pass out, and then you passed out in a dangerous spot, or you passed out and you know it was, it was freezing, and so you froze to death out at night because you just passed out there, or you... Um, passed out and then threw up, but you were passed out, so when you threw up, it stayed there, blocked your lungs, and you choked yourself to death without knowing it. That's the kind of way you generally die here. All right, <clears throat> stimulants. Based on the name, what do you think these ones do? They speed up your neurology. Yeah, exactly, it's the exact opposite. They speed up neural activity. Now they could actually speed it up, like make them fire more, or they could make it easier for them to fire. That's actually, as far as I know, that's technically caffeine does. You'd be like, oh, I need energy, let me uh, drink some caffeine. That actually doesn't give you more energy, it just makes it easier for your body to use the energy you have. But nonetheless, it still feels the same, like you have more energy. <clears throat> All right, so they speed up neural activity. All right, and then hallucinogens. I kind of described what these did. What do these bad boys do? do you think, if I took a hallucinogen or used a, a substance with hallucinogenic properties? It makes you hallucinate. Okay, so what do you mean by that? Um, um, like you present things that, things, that, like things that aren't there, you see things. It alters your perception, right? In this case, you're seeing or hearing things, perceiving things that aren't actually there for the most part. All right, so these are the big uh, perception alterers. Perception altering. They all do alter your perception to a degree. But these ones will actually like, cause you to see things or hear things that might not be there. Or feel that people are doing or thinking things that they're not doing or actually thinking. All right, uh, perception altering. Um, and you can uh, see, hear, feel, uh, et cetera. Things or thoughts that are not real. These are the big perception uh, altering ones. I really wish I knew exactly what time we got out of here. Let me look real quick. It's a little like in the middle of something. Just a, mm -hmm. Which did yesterday? Yes, no, but it's, it's a late start, but it's around it's like a one lunch. Oh, yeah, it's always one lunch. It'll be the same. So it'll be the same. <laughs> I forgot. Wednesdays are always one. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so we got five minutes. So I can at least start talking about one of these. Yeah, let's do stimulants because I think that one's the quickest one. So, depressants, the reason why I'm going <clears> to <throat> finish this one tomorrow is there's actually, this is what confuses people, there's like subcategories of depressants and that really screws people up. So, this is what I want you to know. Depressants slow you down. Stimulants speed you up, neurally, neurologically. Hallucinogens, you are much more likely to see, feel, or think things that aren't actually there. It, it alters your perception the most. All right, <clears throat> okay, but they all do alter your perception to some degree. That one's just like, things that aren't there will be there to you, right? Okay, stimulants. Examples, you've got cocaine. You've got caffeine. You've got nicotine. You've got all of the various types of amphetamines. And did I give you another one? Did I put ecstasy on there? XT is a hybrid, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that. Yeah, those are the main ones that you need to know. So these are all highly addicting because generally <clears throat> people feel, depending on the substance and situation, they feel well, they feel better, but they feel uh, almost superhuman in some cases, uh, especially with cocaine. So um, cocaine, for example, it sends you a flood of uh, dopamine, norepinephrine. And then, of course, mimics those as well. 
in it. So you feel extremely alert and energetic and you think incredibly fast too. <clears throat> and why am I thinking faster, by the way, with this and thinking slower with this? Because you're not like excited and stimulated. Exactly. They're firing more frequently and faster, which usually means I can think faster. A good way to know if somebody's on a stimulant, even coffee, by caffeine from is in the coffee, um, they'll talk faster, like literally talk faster. So like if this is my normal speaking speed, let's say I was on any one of these, which I wouldn't be, obviously, but let's say I was. I might go from talking like this to be talking like this, and I talk like this, and I use these moments right here, and this is a depressant that slows you down, but this one speeds you up, actually, and the whole is actually cause a different, you just see something that's not there, which is kind of cool, because it can be a spider on the wall, but it's not actually there, but I think the same light that you guys are. That might be an example of one. That was really hard to do, by the way. That, that's an example of one. All right, so that, that, was, that was a little extreme, but that's the kind of thing that you'll see. Uh, they'll also get more um, extroverted, usually. All right, extroversion, how much you enjoy seeing other people and having their attention. That's a positive emotion. So that they're usually much more extroverted when they're on these. Now, depressants can do that too because you're less anxious. Because a lot of times some people don't go out and talk and get attention because they're stressed and, and they get the anxiety. So it's actually a different effect. But these can make you more likely to be extroverted because you just feel so good. You're so positive. Like, oh yeah, it's a great day. How are you doing? Oh, and like that's, that's the kind of stuff, the effect it might have on you. Right? <clears throat> so um, these amphetamines, there's all kinds of different ones. There's illegal ones, there's legal ones. Uh, but uh, regardless, they all have the same function. Uh, these ones will make you, um, along with this, will make you feel alert, happy, energetic, uh, and then these can too. But these guys have probably, except for maybe the opiates, which is a depressant, have the worst withdrawals. Because if I don't have them, I'm like incapable of, or at least less able to have positive emotion. All right, so <clears throat> when these wear off, whatever it might be, <coughs> I got a frog in my throat, man. Whenever they wear off, what I'm left with often is uh, irritability. Uh, yeah, I would feel uh, lethargic perhaps, or at least uh, tired. Lethargic means like, oh, I don't wanna get up. And not just I don't wanna get up, it actually feels like my arms are heavier. Uh, so I don't even wanna go do that right now. Like that's, that's when you imagine like somebody, you're like, hey, can you do this? And they're just like, oh. And they get up and they're like, and they just don't want to do it. Like, that's what the authority is, basically. Um, and they'll, they'll uh, uh, make you more predisposed because they're irritable and more pre predisposed to be um, angry, lash out at people. Um, they have the short tempers because they, they need their fix, man. They need their cigarette and the nicotine or they need their coffee for the caffeine. That's why, oh, don't talk to me before I have coffee. It's like, yeah. They're experiencing withdrawal. That's why they're so irritable and they feel like crap and they're in a bad mood and their head hurts, headaches. Is so that's actually caffeine withdrawals. Those people that wake up and need their coffee and otherwise they're a monster uh, beforehand. Uh, or those people that are, cigarettes are not, not that common anymore, but uh, people that are addicted to nicotine and cigarettes, which is super easy. If they uh, haven't had a cigarette in a while, they'll be really uh, impatient, irritable. That's another one, impatient. They might be having a headache, uh, and they'll be quick to say negative things or be snappy, and that's why. Same with cocaine. So these ones are addictive, uh, and the withdrawals are particularly bad because you feel very negative, all right? You're not even able to experience the positive, uh, and you feel extremely negative in general. So that's why these bad boys are addictive very quickly. You can, you can be addicted to caffeine or amphetamines off of one exposure to them. Addicted, boom, Im immediately. Uh, these while you become addicted quickly, it's not just like a one time, you're addicted forever sort of thing. Uh, but they are also highly addictive for the same reason, because you feel like crap when you stop taking them. And also, you actually can feel stupider because your brain doesn't work as well. Like when you're on these, uh, you can actually use, yeah, the amphetamines are study drugs, right? You can remember things better, recall them better, you can think more clearly, uh, you can learn faster. You can perform physical things faster. So these are performance enhancers for sure. And they're almost all banned in physical or mental competitions. The bell's gonna ring. Remember the question over tomorrow, okay? We're picking up where we left off. We were on drugs. We did psychoactive. We talked about that. Withdrawal, right? 
right? No? Yeah. Uh, addiction? And why? And how psychoactive affects your mood and your perception? We talked about the difference between feeling and mood and emotion. You don't have to know the emotion yet, just as long as you understand the difference between feeling and mood and how mood's gonna affect your perception. That'd be cool. Um, so again, any questions about perception affecting, uh, or sorry, drugs affecting your perception, how that changes your behavior? Okay. So we were on the classifications for drugs, psychoactive drugs. We had depressants, stimulants, and hallucinogens. Are right, those my categories? Um, I know this is review, but somebody tell me what depressants are, roughly speaking, but we can categorize them. They're not all exactly the same, but they have a general function that's similar. They slow down your neural activity. Okay, cool. Slow down neural activity. <clears throat> nice. Stimulants? Speed up your neural activity. Speed up. What do you mean by that, by the way? I should have asked you, but. What do you mean by that? So it affects your neural activity and body functions. So and like, what does that mean? Because um, oh. I guess it like makes, it causes you to, how do I say this? Like it causes like, increased heartbeat and stuff because you're, um, actually I don't know how to explain it. It, it. it does increase your uh, heartbeat. And who can explain speeding up neural activity or enhancing it or, or increasing it? Because we gotta actually know what that means. So um, like when you take stimulant, mm -hmm. it speeds up your neural activity. Okay, um, well, when I, so yes, that does happen. I talk faster, my heart rate increases, all of that. Well, but what I'm, what do you mean by more neural activity? Like more of what? So, um, I think it has to do with like neurotransmitters. Okay, yeah. So like more of them are being uh, produced and sent through neurons? Yeah, okay, so my neurons are actually communicating faster and more. They're more active. I have more <clears throat> energy available. Um, I feel alert because I'm getting some of those neurotransmitters uh, uh, sent, like norepinephrine and all that, uh, for a stimulant. Uh, yeah, so they fire quicker and faster, or sorry, quicker and more uh, frequency. And uh, in the case of the, the various stimulant, like caffeine, for example, it doesn't give me more energy per se, but it makes it easier to use the energy. It somehow speeds up the process of converting the energy, uh, which makes it seem like I have more because it's more efficient. All right, cool. Um, Hallucinogens. So I'll give you the points for that, by the way, for a sec. And oh, the first hand I actually saw was over there. Um, so they alter your perception, so you see, hear, feel things that aren't there. Or yeah, exactly. These perception alterers. I mean, these all these these alter your perception too, but not to the same degree as hallucinogens. This is where you see or hear or think things that aren't there or clearly aren't true, whether it's a hallucination or a delusion. Okay, cool. So. Uh, Effect, perception, experience, sensations that aren't there or true. All right, um, what's the difference between a hallucination and a delusion? I think I told you that yesterday. So, oh, so like here it's like when you see something, right, that isn't there, while okay. the is when you perceive information, like, not correctly, I guess we can say. Because let's say that someone's walking behind you, you, must, you might be like, oh, they're following me because the government's up and after to kill me. Exactly. Okay, cool. Which is almost certainly not the case. Absolutely. All right, cool. So, and that's part of psychological disorders, which we'll get into in unit eight, I think, is when we talk about that, clinical psychology. Um, but yeah, that's part of it. Like schizophrenics, for example, um, they experience... Uh, sometimes hallucinations, uh, but sometimes and more often they experience delusions where they think something that's clearly not true is true, like the government's out to get me, or so and so spying on me, or this person wants to kill me, or uh, aliens uh, abducted me, st stuff like that, uh, or they're trying to abduct me. Like that's that's a delusion where um, I am interpreting information way differently than a, a normal person would. All right, and hallucination is again. You're seeing, hearing, or feeling, or tasting, or, or, or smelling something that is not actually there, okay? Um, so, in the scenario, oh, by the way, you have points for that, that was a good explanation. Let's say I, I do take a, hallucin a hallucinogen, 
and trying to find your name here. There it is. Um, and I am seeing spiders on the wall. And you guys are not, because you did not take the hallucinogen that I took, whatever it was. <clears throat> am I getting different sensory information than you are? No. no. The same light rays are coming into my eyes as yours, correct? Yes. Obviously, I have a different angle, but presumably, I shouldn't be getting light rays that are telling me a, that there's a spider there because there isn't a spider there, all right? So where's the difference then? Because we're getting the same sensory info, same information's coming in. What's, where's the error? Right, yeah, and my brain has added this uh, to uh, uh, the sensory information that's coming in, even though it's not actually there, right? That's where the perception part screws up. How do I know I can see things that aren't there, by the way, even as a normal person? You do this every day, hopefully, if you're getting a, 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 if you have a healthy circadian rhythm and you have healthy sleep. What's an example of me seeing, hearing, smelling, etc., things that aren't actually there? that my brain, it kind of proves that your brain can do this on its own. It doesn't need the sensory info to do it. You were actually first. Oh, dreams, right? Yep, dreams. In a dream, I realize I can feel things, like they can affect my dreams, like if someone touches me, I could feel it in my dream, but assuming I'm not talking about the stuff outside, can my brain by itself create an environment for me in my dream where I smell, touch, taste, see things? Yes. Yeah, right? So it can do that, and it does. You can perceive things that aren't there, which is why um, sometimes people are questioning what's real or not because uh, you could fool your own senses. I'm sure most of you remember the Descartes part that we did in AP World or Euro. What was his dilemma, his problem? Rene Descartes, he had like a, a, a dilemma, right? Because he didn't know what to believe. <clears throat> He was trying to deduce his way down to a statement that was 100% true, and he can only come up with one. And what was that one? I'm gonna go with you. Is it, I think, therefore I am? Yeah, what does that mean? Um, it's like basically, I am me because I, I know that I am me because I think that I am me. <laughs> uh, close, it has to do with thinking. But nobody, I don't know anyone else's. Go, you're know. right, you're right, Sal. It, isn't it just because you can think to automatically assume that you can see, that you can believe that you are real. Okay, yes. <laughs> because, I only know that I'm a conscious entity because I have my own independent thoughts. I'm not receiving them from somebody else. Everything else, though, could be some form of hallucination or distortion or deception, right? Could it be? Yes. Yeah, like, I think the example I gave you guys is like, how do you know you're not dreaming right now? And if you think about it, you're like, oh man, am I dreaming right now? <laughs> am I in class? Like, there, there's, there are ways you could figure out you're not dreaming. Like, for example, the old inception explanation. How did you get here? If you can remember how you got here and, and it goes back a long ways, like, okay, this is at least this version of reality. But if you ever think, how did I get here? And you're like, oh man, how did I get here? Then, then you might actually be in a dream. Um, but can my perception of sensory information be deceived? Yes. It definitely can, right? So that's what Descartes was worried about. I was like, how do I know this is real? How do I know you're actually there? That my brain's not just projecting you and I'm talking to an empty classroom, right? Or you're sitting here in an empty classroom listening to a teacher who's not actually here with students around that are not actually there. Like, how do you actually know that? Your brain could be being deceived by another program, a dream, a hallucination of some sort through a drug, whatever. Uh, it could. It's a possibility. You don't know for sure. You think you know, but you're not 100% sure. Uh, the only thing he could know is that, yes, because I do have my own thoughts, I at least know I exist in some form. Even if this isn't reality, um, I, I, I do exist somewhere. <clears throat> this is probably reality, though, so you're all right. Okay, okay. <laughs> probably. Okay, um, so we did stimulants. We talked about some examples, I think. Caffeine, uh, nicotine. Uh, what else? Cocaine, amphetamines, right? There's lots of different types of amphetamines, different variations of the molecule. Methamphetamine is a really popular illegal one, especially here in the valley. Um, uh, and that one's highly addictive, and that one really degenerates you quick. Oh man, I saw this picture of a girl who started taking meth at like 32, 
And she looked like a normal 32 year old woman. And then like two years later after meth, she looked like 57, like minimum, like had like craters in her face, her hair had been lost, it was, it was graying, her skin looked uh, old and, and, and weather beaten. It was like, whoa. She aged like 20 years in two years uh, because of meth. Anyways, um, what are some of my withdrawal symptoms here uh, of stimulants in general? They can vary in intensity, but uh, in general, these things excite me, arouse me, make me feel good and happy and alert and energetic. And so what do I feel when I'm um, experiencing withdrawal symptoms of these? Okay, I can feel lethargic, perhaps. What else? Headaches. They could have headaches, that's a common one. That's no fun. What else? Irritability. Irritability, absolutely. <coughs> because I'm experiencing the discomfort, oops, because I'm experiencing discomfort, uh, I'm way more likely to be irritated by stuff you're doing because I'm already kind of in a bad mood or, or suffering in some way. Fatigue. Yeah, fatigue, well, I can put that with lethargy, yeah. Um, because you're irritated and uncomfortable, you're, uh, generally far less patient, so you're impatient, and you're much more easily angry, <clears throat> all right? Okay, um, and that makes sense because I lack, after taking these, I lack the dopamine or norepinephrine or whatever neurotransmitters make me feel alert, awake, happy, uh, and so I'm gonna feel like I'm devoid of those things. It's gonna feel quite miserable. I'll feel irritable, tired, unfocused, etc., and I'm gonna want to get these things back, all right? And that's why these can be particularly dangerous. And uh, amphetamines, depending on the amphetamine, and cocaine can be addictive immediately after one or two uses. Um, nicotine and caffeine, as far as I know, take more than one uh, use, but uh, they are pretty addictive as well. And you, got, you guys all know that, the whole coffee thing, you know, can't, I don't wake up, or don't talk to people about coffee, that sort of stuff, because they're like this until they get their coffee. All right. Hallucinogens. Oh wait, I didn't get you guys. Who gave me an example for these? I know you. You. There was two more. You. Who gave me the fourth one? You. You. Okay, you're kind of like pointing to the side too. Usually you point your. There you go. That's pointing. To the side. <laughs> All right. Boom, boom, boom. Um, hallucinogens. Uh, some examples of these are. You guys are all like, I looked at my notes, I'm not ready to say. No. Uh, THC is a really common one. And that was found in uh, cannabis, marijuana, et cetera. Uh, all of those weed products, uh, whether it's um, through the oil and vaping it to smoking it to uh, eating it to whatever it might be, that's the active ingredient that uh, generally gives you the um, um, perception and experience that, that you get through it. Um, what's my other one? LSD? Is that the other one? Okay. <clears throat> LSD, uh, and uh, I don't even know the names of them because they're different ones, but mushrooms generally are hallucinogens. Um, you can either eat them and they're fine, or they're hallucinogens and they change your perception, or they kill you. So it's like a dice roll. If you see a mushroom, don't eat it, because uh, there's a lot of ways it can go wrong. And at, at best, you'll just eat something that's mildly nutritious, at worst you die. So uh, make sure you know which mushrooms you're eating. Uh, and you can OD fairly easily on uh, the psychedelic mushrooms as far as I know too. So uh, wouldn't recommend it. <clears throat> but I don't know a whole lot about the specifics, but I guess hallucinogens have been banned for a long time. And recently they've been doing experiments on um, helping people out with various uh, therapies, whether it's phobias, um, whether it's uh, neurological disorders, like you know when they start losing their memory and stuff like that, um, and other things too. And for somehow these hallucinogens are able to help them out. They like have these experiences that change their lives and make them not afraid of things or embrace things. So there, there's some cool stuff coming out, but it's really, it's what you call the scent. It's just developing, it's, it's, it's fresh, it's new. We don't know a whole lot about it or the long-term effects, but we might hear things about these over the next few decades, helping people out, uh, being more used medically. But as for right now, we don't know a whole lot. All right, we do know a lot about THC though. So I'm not, I can't talk too much about these, uh, other than the fact that uh, you can definitely OD on these things. Uh, and also, depending on how you are as a person, how vulnerable you are to negative emotion, uh, you could also, when you take these, have what's called a bad trip and hallucinate very badly uh, to the point that it's just terrifying. Um, 
they make fun of these things on like Family Guy and stuff. If you guys have ever seen them at South Park as well. Um, bad trips. Uh, I've never had one, obviously, but bad trips can. Uh, uh, they sound quite terrifying. You're essentially stuck in this world of hallucinations that are hurting or damaging or or terrifying to you, and you're just stuck in them for you know up to hours. So that doesn't sound fun to me. Um, but anyways. Yeah, you're, you could potentially have what's called a bad trip, uh, especially with the, the, the mushroom uh, portion, uh, and you could OD on it. So that's all we'll say about those, but THC, there's quite a bit we can say about this one. THC is super common, um, uh, whether it's medical marijuana or, or recreational marijuana. Uh, it's pretty widespread, even if it's illegal in your state here in the US and, and elsewhere. Um, and this one can be beneficial. It can act as a painkiller. <clears throat> in some sense. It can also help um, um, encourage appetite. Um, so if you're lucky enough to be one of the people, or unlucky, I guess, um, it could make food actually taste better and help include, uh, increase your appetite uh, uh, chemically and also just uh, by enjoyment. So uh, you've got um, as a painkiller, it can function as a, an appetite enhancer. So that's good for people who are going through chemotherapy for cancer. Because chemotherapy is basically, they inject you with a poison that would kill you if they gave you enough. It definitely makes you sick, makes you nauseous. Because it's actual poison, so your body's trying to expel it. So you feel nauseous and sick and fatigued the whole time. But what it does is the chemotherapy only kills fast growing cells. It doesn't kill regular slow growing cells uh, in, in, a, in a right amount. So what that does is the only things that grow really fast on your body are your skin, nails, sorry not skin, hair, nails, uh, and cancer cells. So those three get killed and the rest of you suffers but lives. Uh, so that's what it does. So if I'm nauseous and I'm experiencing pain, this can help me gain an appetite, which is difficult for chemotherapy patients because they're constantly um, uh, nauseous and throwing up if they try to eat. Uh, and they're also in a state of, uh, of pain and, and, and uh, discomfort at the very least. So that can help with that. Um, but yeah, if you guys are wondering why chemotherapy makes you feel that way, it only kills those fast growing cells, which is why when people are on chemotherapy, they tend to lose their nails and their hair um, and their cancer cells generally. Uh, die and that's the goal while their other cells live. So that's what it does and uh, this is how that can help. It can also help reduce anxiety and I'm going to put in parentheses by the, all these can because it depends on how your body responds to it um, and also potentially which version of, uh, of uh, narcotic you're using here. <clears throat> Some people it doesn't though and here's the risk you run. Um, some people, it, it doesn't necessarily help with pain or appetite, which doesn't really matter. But with some people, uh, instead of reducing anxiety, it can actually make it worse. All right, and here's where the hallucination part comes into it. What this does is it can change your perception. And what often happens uh, for people who are, are, are anxious, if it doesn't help their anxiety, which it can, it can make them more loose and relaxed and enjoyable. Or, depending on their brain, it can make them more paranoid. So this is kind of like a, a delusion in that you'll take information that's normally um, innocuous or harmless, and to you, you'll perceive it as something that is potentially dangerous or threatening or critical, all right? So uh, you could um, think people are, when, if they're being normal to you, you can think that if you're on this, that they're being mean to you, or they're questioning you, um, or they're um, uh, not, what's the word I'm looking for? loyal to you, whatever it might be, uh, and they'll make you more anxious about talking or interacting with them, and it could cause you to seclude yourself and, and make your anxiety worse. So it uh, alters your perception, which could make you more anxious or uh, suffer from delusions. Uh, and that's kind of why it's categorized as a hallucinogen, because it alters your perception regarding uh, taste and experience with the nausea, uh, and it can also, um, cause you to suffer from uh, mild delusions where again you're just you're taking everyday info and you're interpreting it incorrectly uh, more negatively usually and that would of course make your anxiety worse all right so it really depends on you and how your body responds to it 
uh, as far as how your neurons uh, are wired and how many receptors you have and, and how you think and all of that. So it, it's a variable. Could help you, could hurt you. You don't know, obviously, until you end up experiencing it. So, I think I've told you this before. Why is it a horrible idea to use this stuff before you are uh, uh, in your mid-20s, at least? Okay, it doesn't necessarily stop producing brain cells, but yeah, what it does is it impairs your development. And this isn't just a theory, by the way. They absolutely know this. It is very clear that if you use this stuff regularly before your brain's developed by your mid to late 20s, um, it will actually impair your brain development. I don't mean like just change it. I mean make it worse. Your memory will be worse. Your IQ will be worse. Your inhibition control will be worse. All the stuff you want in your frontal lobe will be uh, a degree worse depending on, you know, how much you use it and, and, and all of that. All right, so we do know it can definitely damage um, cognition and memory. So cognition is like all my thinking faculties. It, it, if I'm talking about the frontal lobe, I'm talking about cognition. It's my thinking. What should I do? How should I plan for this? How can I, pro what, how should I overcome this obstacle? Uh, should I do this or not? Um, uh, impulse control, that, that kind of stuff is, is cognition. Should I, should I or shouldn't I do that? Is it a good idea to do this now or later? That kind of stuff, that's cognition, <clears throat> all right? Uh, and it can uh, damage your uh, cognition and memory uh, before brain completes development. And it's not a question of it might, it, it, it will. So if you plan on being a pothead later in life and you want to, A, it's legal in, most, in a lot of states. You could, I guess. Um, I would certainly, though, at the very least, if you plan on doing it, save it till your brain's done developing. So you can at least be 100% you uh, before you, you start doing that. But anyways, yeah, so again, it is increasingly legal. It's legal here and in other states too, but uh, try to stay away from that temptation at least till your brain's done developing. All right, that's a personal choice of yours when you guys get out of high school. <clears throat> okay, any questions about THC and how it can uh, negatively affect you? We good on that one? Okay, so those are the two easier ones, I think, anyway. And ecstasy, by the way, is a mix of these two. So you can experience hallucin uh, hallucinations, but it's also a stimulant. Uh, this one is the, the rave drug, and the reason why it's the rave drug is uh, you will perceive information differently. So if I go to a, an EDM sort of thing, and there's a lot of lights and sounds, it will... Um, make me experience them differently, uh, usually enjoyably, I'm assuming, um, at, at these uh, uh, events, uh, but it also speeds up your neural uh, activity. So you are more prone to becoming dehydrated or overheating um, while you're on it. So we do have people that have heat stroke, uh, who could potentially die of overuse uh, because their uh, system is overly stimulated. Uh, like I said, to the point that it becomes de dehydrated really quickly uh, as they're overheating, because obviously, if you're getting hot, your body, how does it cool down? You sweat um, to try to, uh, of course, lose some energy in contact with the evaporation in the wind. Um, so if you're constantly active and you're sweating constantly, you will dehydrate yourself and you could pass out or die or develop complications from that. Um, but I'm not gonna pretend like it's common for people to die from using this, but that is a possible um, detriment to your health. Uh, but people take it at those because it makes them also, this is the hallucinogen part as well, uh, along with the uh, experiencing the lights and sound differently, it also makes people a lot more friendly for some reason. Um, so people enjoy uh, talking to, and even physical contact, just like, you know, hand on the arm sort of thing. Um, they, for whatever reason, are more likely to do those things, and they enjoy them more while they're under the influence uh, of this narcotic. All right. But we don't have a lot of info on how it affects you over the long term. But pretty much all of these long term use is bad uh, in that it affects your brain chemistry. You can become addicted or it would affect your brain development and damage you or your organs like your liver, which is what, what breaks this stuff down, your, the toxins in your body. Uh, it can damage those things over long term, pretty much all of them. All right. So just know that these things can be uh, Great if used medically or, or correctly, if it's legal and all that, but um, almost all these long-term use does have negative effects, like I said, uh, liver or kidneys. Those are the things that filter stuff out of your bloodstream like this. 
Uh, it can damage them long-term use, and then you die much earlier. Uh, or uh, you can affect your uh, neurochemistry, you become addicted, or it can affect your brain development, and it could uh, worsen your memory or cognition. So uh, I wouldn't recommend, even if this stuff is legal, um, using it chronically over a long time unless it's medically um, uh, necessary. Like you're, you're going through chemotherapy and that's the only way you can not throw up and you can eat. Uh, that's obviously a good time to use it. <clears throat> Any questions about ecstasy? All right, cool, so let me just put this down here. Um, stimulant, so it increases your activity, uh, but then of course you're prone to overheating, dehydration, uh, and it does enhance sensory perception. So those lights and sounds and raves and whatnot where this is popular become more novel and appealing and enjoyable. Uh, and also for whatever makes people more friendly. Which is why there are almost no fights at raves. <clears throat> but at other concerts, there are. Okay. Any questions about stimulants or hallucinogens? Yes. Yeah, you can. All right, depressants. I save this for last because it is the most... Uh, Nuanced, difficult. What was that? Depressing. Yeah. No, I'm aware. the Great Depression. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, so there's three subcategories. All right. This is where people get confused. So these obviously are generalized activities um, uh, or developments of these drugs, like altering perception, speeding up neural activity, slowing down. So all three of these, I'm experiencing what? What's happening with all three of these categories that I haven't put up there yet? Actually, I'll put them up there, hold on. Alcohol. Um, opiates. And barbiturates. Uh, what's gonna be common among all three of these? Because they all do different things, but there is one commonality among them. They reduce uh, neuroactivity and they slow down your uh... Yeah, exactly. They slow down all of your uh, neural activity, which of course is going to slow down your motor functions, your reaction time, everything's going to be slowed down during this. Okay. Alcohol. We know what alcohol is. Um, that is, of course, you can get it from multiple types of uh, foods by fermenting it. Um, I'll save that for last just because we know the most about it. Um, opiates, painkillers. Examples would be uh, codeine. I'm going to spell these wrong, I think. Codeine. I know that's not how you spell it. Um, heroin, uh, Vicodin, that's another one. Oxycodone, these are all different molecule forms, but they all perform the same uh, function. And most of them, which is where the name comes from, come from the opium seed slash plant or poppy seed. All right, those are the, um, um, uh, they discovered this I don't know when they discovered it, but it became popular in the 1800s when the British um, found them in, in the Middle East and Afghanistan and started uh, selling them across the world because they were so addictive. <laughs> what were you gonna say? I said no, I'm happy yeah, that's like what we're known for. Yeah. Having opioids. Oh, yeah. Well, it was the British in the 19th century. <clears throat> but yeah, they discovered them. Anyways, um, these are highly addictive. Uh, why do you think these might be highly addictive? Like withdrawals are particularly devastating when I'm trying to readjust uh, my neurochemistry. Uh, because they provide a rush of endorphins. Mm -hmm. So um, when you have that excess, your brain kind of like slows down and shuts off its production of endorphins, like yes. naturally. So um, when you're not on the drugs, you feel like you're not getting the endorphin uh, production that you normally would. So you're like more discomfort, like you experience more discomfort. Yep. Any discomfort or pain that I would normally be feeling that my natural endorphins take care of? Because you'd be surprised, by the way, how many parts of you are aching, but you don't know it because your endorphins are active. All those parts are gonna ache to the max without your endorphins going. Also, too, uh, endorphins actually make you feel good, too. They give you kind of a warm, floaty feeling. Uh, it's called a runner's high. If you go out and do some sort of activity for a long time um, that is uh, intense, like running uh, or something like that, you'll actually feel really good for a while. You almost feel like you have more energy um, uh, and you're not gonna ache. Anything that you hurt when you're playing your sport uh, will only hurt mildly, if at all. And then later on, you'll feel a lot more um, uh, lethargic, 
uh, uncomfortable because the endorphins have worn off. So now the injury you had that barely hurt or didn't hurt, now it aches um, and you won't feel as good. So uh, they lose when they become neurochemically dependent, right? Their body stops producing endorphins because like, we're good, we got plenty, look. And then, you know, it's actually cocaine or, or so not cocaine, uh, codeine or heroin um, or um, uh, uh, Vicodin or whatever it is, whatever opiate. Your brain thinks that it has it, stops making endorphins. So when you get off this drug, you lose the high you were in, your euphoric, warm, floaty feeling, and you now feel all pains and you don't have that good feeling to go with it. You feel terrible. So you're uncomfortable, possibly in pain, uh, and you are greatly desiring to go back to at least normal, but probably high up on your cloud uh, on these um, uh, opiates. All right, so or opioids. So withdrawals are um, intense more so than the other two. So as far as depressants go, this is the worst one to be addicted to because the withdrawal is the most, what's the word I'm looking for? Intense, painful, uncomfortable, debilitating, uh, along with perhaps the dependence on some of the more intense stimulants. Uh, those are the worst ones to be addicted to. Okay, um, what was I gonna say about these? Oh, I don't think I've told you, I don't think it's in the notes, but you're never supposed to mix any of these three together. Like it always says that if you're taking these for like, let's say you had a surgery and the doctor actually prescribes you Vicodin or oxycodone or codeine or whatever, legally, right, to deal with the very intense pain you have while you're recovering for surgery for a couple weeks or whatever, it's gonna tell you not to mix with alcohol and not to mix with tranquilizers, which are barbiturates, by the way. Why would it tell me not to? Why would that? Potentially, because it does, it could kill you, and it often does. People do this on, on accident all the time. Is it because, um, so they all slow down your um, like function, so if you use two at the same time, they'll slow it down to the point where they like, all break off, and then you like, die. Yeah, exactly. You won't actually have enough neural activity or enough um, uh, physiological activity with your heartbeat and your blood pumping and all that to the point that you'll actually die of, of either oxygen deprivation or, or, or some sort of lack of neural activity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, they can be deadly. People do this all the time on accident because sleeping pills, I'm not sure if you qualify that as a barbiturate or not, but sleeping pills also depress your system. So sometimes people will uh, drink and then they'll take sleeping pills to go to bed and then they never wake up because uh, the combination of the two slowed them down so much that they ended up uh, dying in their sleep uh, by doing that. It's a common way that females try to commit suicide too. Um, men are much more likely to just shoot or hang themselves. Uh, but women, for whatever reason, are more likely to try poisoning themselves, and that's a common way they do it. And um, a lot of times it doesn't work for them, fortunately. Um, <clears throat> uh, but the gun and the hanging generally do, so men are more successful with their suicide attempts, which we'll talk about later when we talk about aggression and violence um, and antisocial behavior. So I didn't just randomly throw that out there. We actually talk about that in this class. Um, <clears throat> but that's a, a common one that they, they, they try to do with. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure where sleeping pills would be categorized. I'm sure it depends on the sleeping pill too, but I'm guessing it'd be under a barbiturate, but I'd, I'd have to look that up, I'm not sure. If somebody actually could look that up real quick, that'd be wonderful how it's classified. All right, uh, barbiturates. These are tranquilizers. I always forget the uh, names of these ones. Anatol is one of them. Oh, there's another one, it starts with a B. Maybe it was an N actually. Nembutol? Nembutol, yeah. Uh, these ones are uh, much well, or sorry, much less known, less popular, because um, you don't often use tranquilizers, but these are obviously used to disable, potentially, um, a large animal, uh, and that does that by, um, like they seem like Jurassic Park and big movies like that, or like at zoos. Uh, they'll tranquilize them with uh, some form of barbiturate, and uh, that just slows down their neural system so much that all they can do is kind of like lay down and rest. They like they can't even move necessarily because their 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 neural uh, functioning is slowed down so much that they don't have the energy or ability to like turn around and bite you because they're just so relaxed and slowed down in this tranquil uh, state. Obviously, these are very dangerous because if you give someone too much, they just die. Like it just stops everything and you die. So there's a very fine mix. Um, I they might actually qualify. I'm not sure the category in this one either. Um, uh, Damn, what do they call it when you uh, are out for surgery? Anesthesia. Anesthesia, thank you. They, that might qualify as a barbiturate as well. If somebody could look that one up too, that'd be wonderful. Um, oh yeah, sleep pills are what? Barbiturate. Okay, yeah, they are. I thought they were. 
I had no evidence for that though. I just guessed because I was I was assuming that's what they do, so they're probably barbiturate. So now I know they actually are. Sweet. Um, I would imagine also that. Um, damn, I just asked you guys what it was called. Anesthesia. Anesthesia. Yeah. Anesthesia would probably also qualify, and that also is a is a uh, very dangerous mixture because if they do it wrong, you just don't wake up. Wow. It is also barbiturate. Sweet. Yes. Anesthesia. So these all slow you down to the point that you uh, can't feel or can't uh, move or can't breathe, uh, at least normally. And then if you get too much, you just can't do those things at all and you end up dying, right? And that's why if you guys ever have a surgery, the anesthesiologist is actually a separate professional. It's not just like a doctor hooks you up and you go to sleep. They like track, they, they, they hook you up to the machine that they have to see your heart rate and all that. And they know your weight, uh, body weight and all that, your body mass. And they very slowly creep it in to get to a fine line where you're um, unconscious and not feeling things, but also still alive. Because uh, if they don't do it enough, you feel things and you move, and that screws up the surgery, uh, and also makes you suffer. And then if they go do too much, you die. So it's very um, difficult to do. And that's why they do not like to do it with infants and babies, because they're so small that a change in the amount uh, can end up killing them uh, quite easily. So they always try to avoid anesthesia for uh, young kids as much as possible. When you're bigger, it's better because there's a little more uh, room for error as far as if they give you too much or too little. But for infants, man, if you don't know, and if you have too much and they're only a few pounds, that's just it for them, <clears throat> unfortunately. All right, so that, those are barbiturates. And uh, that's why you don't want to mix them with the other things. Okay, and alcohol are, and yeah, these are addictive as well. Oh, also, a lot of anti-anxiety meds are forms of barbiturates because they, um, they help you relax, literally. They slow down all of your system, so that stuff that was stressing you out, it just doesn't matter as much because your body is uh, in a relaxed uh, state and it can't even be anxious because anxiety is when all of your uh, um, um, stress responses are on. So your heart rate's up, your blood um, uh, pressure's up, your breathing's up because your body thinks you're in a fight or flight situation. So some of these can cure the symptoms uh, for anxiety by relaxing you and then the whatever it is that you're worried about doesn't bother you as much. But again, does that fix your anxiety? Mm -hmm. No, it's just treating the symptom. The source of your anxiety is still there. You're still worried about whatever it is, but it's not affecting you physically uh, like it would. So it's much better, obviously, just to take your anxiety and deal with that and then the whole thing goes away rather than just numb yourself. <clears throat> okay, last one, alcohol. Man, my throat's going dry. Alcohol. This one's very popular because it's legal. <clears throat> but um, why do people, I think I told you this yesterday, maybe I didn't though. Why do people uh, become addicted to alcohol? What, what benefit does it have? Aside from if my body happens to receive it well, like as far as my uh, reward system, and I, I get like a dopamine experience from it. Obviously, if I feel good, uh, by drinking alcohol, I'm gonna like to do it. But besides those people, because they're not the only ones that get addicted to alcohol, become alcoholics, why might this actually cause me to become dependent upon it, even if I don't get that positive response? Because like, if you're going through a hard time and like, you forget it for like a little bit, like once you're off it, it makes you feel it even harder, so you want more, so you like forget about it. Very close. The only thing that was really wrong about that was you don't forget it, actually. You just don't care, exactly. It just doesn't, for whatever reason, it just doesn't bother you. Every time somebody's um, drunk, like let's say like drunk drivers, for example, they pull them over, cop knows that they're drunk, they've taken the station, sure enough, blood alcohol's way over and, and they shouldn't be driving. If you ask them, you know, if they know they're drunk, they almost always do know they're drunk. Do you think they know that it's legal to do that? Yes, they do, to drive. Do you think they know the consequences for being caught, getting a DUI, like losing your license and paying a fine and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. They do. They're fully aware of what they're doing wrong, what the consequences are, but they just don't care, right? It just doesn't bother them. They're just like, whatever. It just, for whatever reason, even though they're fully aware of it, they don't care. So what we would call that is impaired judgment, all right? So you know the consequences, but you just your judgment's poor. It's just like, oh, well, whatever. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Uh, you're not actually assessing the uh, situation uh, well there. So the odds that um, if you decide to drunk drive when you're drunk are actually higher because you know you're drunk and you shouldn't, but you just don't care. So um, it's a good idea not to uh, get there. That's why you have designated drivers. If you guys 
when you're older, uh, go out and go to an event where they're drinking. You want to have the designated driver because um, who just doesn't drink at all because the likelihood that if they do drink, that they're going to drink while drunk anyway is, is way too high. That's why you have that designated driver or you take the keys away from the person that is too drunk to make the decision on, on their own because they're likely to do it anyway because they don't care. <clears throat> all right, cool. So still have cognition. And what I mean by that is they can still think about things. They understand them. They don't forget them necessarily. Uh, they are just numbed to or don't care about them. All right. I give you the example of uh, the Soviet Union had, and still does actually, but it was even worse during the Cold War. Their consumption of vodka was insanely high, super high. And it wasn't because they loved the taste of vodka. Why was it that the people in the Communist Soviet Union were so heavily dependent on alcoholism? They're, they're just, their general circumstances were just so poor, like uh, under communism, they were starving, they were cold, and they were living poorly, so they had to turn to something that it's Yeah, numbing. exactly. Their lives sucked. They were in Russia, which can be just kind of sucky already just, just because it's so cold, but all right, we'll say that they don't care about that as much. In the Communist Soviet Union, they were so deprived of necessities and individual choice and controlled and had such terrible lives and worked so much and were told what to do and couldn't do certain things and there would be punishments for them. They would just uh, drink those worries away. Did they forget about them? No. no but what happened? They didn't care about them, right? So if you got any stress or anxiety, uh, alcohol could be a wonderful way uh, to not forget about it but no longer care about it. So uh, people that experience things like unemployment, they get fired, they get a divorce or lose uh, a loved one or whatever, they could succumb to alcoholism, not because they forget or it makes them feel good, but it makes them not care about uh, the thing that's negatively affecting their life. All right, so that's what it does. Uh, and that's why it can be so addictive. <clears throat> okay. Um, yes, and you can become dependent on it because uh, uh, psychologically, because they don't want to experience that pain, so they keep drinking, keep drinking. But also, uh, when you do drink so much, you do develop a neurochemically, you also become neurochemically addicted to it as well. So even just to feel normal, you have to be a certain degree of inebriated uh, or drunk, however you want to phrase it, uh, to, to even operate normally. Otherwise, you'll be experiencing some form of withdrawal, discomfort, um, uh, and anxiety, all right? So that's um, a bad, it's a, how do I phrase this? It can be detrimental to your life, negative to your life, impacted negatively, because it clouds your judgment, obviously. If you don't care about consequences, you're more likely to do stupid things. All right, that's why um, uh, rape occurs more frequently when people are inebriated. Why might that be? Do they know rape is wrong? Yeah. They do, but what changes it? They don't, care. they don't care about the consequence, right? Or they think they won't get caught or something stupid like that. So judgment's impaired. So you're much more likely to do dangerous slash illegal things. Uh, or those drunk guys are like, yeah, I can do this. I can jump over this garbage can. And then they, you know, don't. And then they, they run and jump and fall on their face and, you know, break their jaw and all that stupid stuff. Um, a lot of that is because their judgment is actually impaired uh, by the, the alcohol. They know the consequence. They just, for whatever reason, think they can do it. And then they just can't. All right. Um, also, what's another one? For whatever reason, it makes people more friendly. Actually, no, wait, I do know the reason. Friendlier, in general. Sometimes people can become more mean, though. I'm actually going to put that too. Friendlier or mean. This is because what would cause me generally from just being mean to you straight out? You know there's consequences. Yeah, there can be consequences, right? I can make you upset, and you might want to retaliate, or even it just feels awkward to just rip on somebody and, and especially if other people are seeing you do it, right? But why am I more likely to do that if I'm uh, under the influence of alcohol? You don't care about the consequences, right? Uh, same thing about being friendly, too. Some people are actually just naturally very friendly, uh, but they're what you call introverted. So they get a lot of anxiety if they're talking to new people or attention is on them. So why are they all of a sudden more talkative when they drink alcohol? Because they don't care, right? That anxiety doesn't bother them, right? So that's kind of what it does. I'm oversimplifying it, but, but that's largely what's going on there with those developments. So uh, it could make you friendlier or meaner, uh, but the bad things are, of course, your judgment impairment, more likely to do dangerous, illegal things. Uh, and also, uh, it does actually damage your 
Uh, I don't want to just say brain because that's so generic. It can damage permanently your memory, so your ability to form memories or recall them, uh, and it can also impair your, uh, it can reduce your IQ. It can actually kill brain neurons in uh, your frontal lobe, which are responsible for your thinking functions. So your problem solving, um, your uh, uh, goal setting, um, any thinking process, even the memory part, can deteriorate over time because it does actually kill those brain cells. So it damages your memory and other cognitive faculties. Yeah? That can, yeah, because it does, for whatever reason, impair their, their hippocampus, which is part of your um, um, memory storage functioning. Uh, and yes, so it can impair the memory in that moment, but I'm talking about like long term too. Like if I drank heavily for 10 years, I am almost certainly going to be stupider because I have a reduced IQ because I've damaged certainly uh, neurons in my frontal lobe, which are responsible for my cognitive abilities, judgment, etc. cetera. Uh, and my memory as well will also be impaired. And I mean permanently, as in those neurons are dead and I can't replace them. All right, so I can no longer remember things as well or store them as well or recall them as well, however, however you want to phrase it. Uh, but yeah, in the moment too, it does impair that uh, as well. But I'm talking long term. Like you lose them forever, dude. You kill those brain cells, they're not coming back. All right. There is a degree of plasticity we talked about, you know, in certain hemisphere or certain lobes, but frontal lobe for the most part, you damage those, nothing can pick up the slack. So it's just gone. All right. And, and some of the memory uh, oriented ones uh, as well. Uh, and also, uh, organ damage over the long term. The most common one is liver damage. Uh, and uh, if you're an alcoholic, you're much likely to die from liver failure way before, you know, your 70s or your 60s or, or whatever. I mean, you can, I, there are people who have died from liver damage in their 30s and 40s from alcohol abuse. So it's, a, it's pretty gnarly. <clears throat> Those can be used to counteract each other, all right? So, how can I phrase this? Anybody ever seen that movie, what is it called? Denzel Washington. It's the one with the flight or something where he's got the plane and he is crashing and then he like lands it upside down or something. So he's super famous because he saved this whole, no one's seen this movie apparently. Uh, so he's uh, he was really popular like 10 years ago, but you guys were little kids so. It's a, it's a true story. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure the, de the degree to which it's true, but the fact that this guy crazily landed this plane in a very unorthodox way because he had to um, was true. I'm not sure the backstory behind it. But anyways, in this movie, he's a pilot, and he's a terrible person in general. Uh, he's an alcoholic, um, and he can't fly drunk because his, his, his judgment's impaired. Uh, you also, by the way, your reaction speed, your thinking is just slower because your neural activity is slow, right? That's what it does. I forgot to put that, by the way. Slow reaction and thinking speed. He can't fly a plane drunk because he can't take the information fast enough. Um, uh, he's more likely to um, um, uh, you know, drift off in thought um, and be over-relaxed. So he found a brilliant way to... Uh, even himself out. So if I'm, if my neuro, neuro system is slow, what can I do to make it normal again or pick it up? Take a, Take a stimulant, right. So this guy snorted cocaine. So he'd be super drunk, and then before he'd go on the flight, he'd snort cocaine, and then he'd be able to fly. And then he'd, he'd, he'd land and then keep doing the, the, the drug, uh, the alcohol thing. Uh, so the reason why, at least in this movie, it was so controversial, it's like, wow, look, he did this crazy landing that he had to do. He had to like land it upside down or something like that for it to work because the way the engine or the wing was damaged, it, you couldn't do it normally. Um, so it was kind of a, a miracle and really good pilot ship on his part. Uh, but then they, of course, did a blood alcohol test and they saw like, wow, he was high on cocaine and super, super over on the blood alcohol content and maybe some other things too. So uh, it wasn't as simple as you're a hero. It was like, did you cause this? Because you're on all these things. You're certainly not supposed to be on all these things. But anyways, yeah, so some people do that. Uh, they, can, they, they, they try to use stimulants to counteract, you know, a uh, depressant that they're on or vice versa. But that can be tricky and dangerous because um, uh, mixing in these things can uh, uh, have consequences you're not aware of, whether it's overstimulation, understimulation, organ damage, whatever it might be. But uh, yeah, generally speaking, 
some people can try to do that. Any questions about those and alcohol? So for alcohol, you're going to want to know why people become addicted to it, because it um, reduces anxiety by essentially making them not care about consequences or, 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 or negative experiences, but also the damage that it, it, it causes. It kills brain cells, so you lose permanently memory and um, cognitive functioning, but it can also damage your um, organs, like your liver, for example, over time, and it impairs your, uh, sorry, it reduces your reaction speed, which can be very dangerous if you're driving. Uh, some guy pulls out in front of you and you hit the brakes or swerve and you're normal, great. You're on alcohol though, you're gonna react slower, you're just gonna hit him, right? Or you're gonna see that red light go too late because your reaction speed's slow and, you, and then you blow the stop sign or you blow the red light and then you just T-bone somebody and kill you or them, uh, which is why that happens so often, by the way. Uh, they just react too slowly to the light signal and then they just end up going through a red light and you know, hitting people. Anyways, you guys got that? So we understand these three mini categories of depressants mm -hmm. and why they're addictive and dangerous mm -hmm. and what they do. Mm -hmm. Good, take a break. <laughs>